Our text this uh, morning is from the book of 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. We'll be reading the 16th through the 21st verses. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. And I'm reading from the uh, New International Version. Your version will be slightly different, but the point is the same. From now on, uh -huh. therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Right. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. Right. So you see, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Mm -hmm. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Right. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the world's trespasses against them, entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So you see, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you, we plead with you yes. on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Racism permeates every aspect of our society, from education to health care to housing, to criminal justice, entertainment, religion. This problem has existed from the moment the term race was created. And the reason this ugliness is so important, the reason I can get in the pulpit and tell you, is because just about everybody in that uh, uh, presidential race, everybody, maybe save one, professes Christianity. Publicly professes Christianity. There is something not only disheartening, but sinful when anybody who professes to know the Lord is caught up in this kind of hateful dialogue. There's some wrong. And somebody has got to call it wrong. Right. We tend to associate racism with just black and white, and we just say, well, it's the, it's the political situation here. But I looked up the origin. You know I love words. And I looked up the origin of the word racism. It was coined, this is just for your information, by an American general by the name of Richard Henry Pratt, who in 1902 was considered responsible for the solution to the so-called Indian problem in America. Now, America had already seized all this land from Native Americans, from Indians all over the country. Those who survived were being killed and displaced. And Pratt got the U.S. government to build schools for Indian children to force them into assimilation. Right. He decided that the race problem was the fact that they had their own heritage. He wanted them to assimilate to the majority culture. Now that was bad enough, but they were not allowed to speak their native language. They were put in schools that were actually prisons. They were beaten. They were horribly mistreated. They were sexually abused, killed, and, and Pratt was successful in destroying a number of tribes right around here in the Northeast. This one man, considered a hero by some. Racism is America. You just need to know that. You know, people say it's the problem with America. No, no, it was built in America. Right. I, mean, I just want to tell you that because I don't want y'all to be confused about it. Yeah. I don't want to be confused about it. It's a global problem. It's deeply embedded in our culture, in humankind. People have been debating this since slavery. Right. Uh, you know, how, how are you going to fix this up? You know, I've grown up with it. So I know that it's a part of my problem. I know it's a part of my issue. I grew up in the South. I went in the, the colored door. I, I, I drank at the colored water fountain. I saw that. I, I lived that. I was spit on. I mean, so we all have our stories. And here's my point. Amen. I have studied this all my life. I have looked at it. I have joined movements. I have done The only solution to our problem of racism is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only solution. I, I really, I mean that from my heart. I, I'm not just trying to say that because that's what a preacher says. Apostle Paul writes, our only hope is God, who through Christ reconciles the world to himself, not counting trespasses against the world. Reconciliation, that is the answer. Now in this text, the Apostle Paul is speaking of Jews and Gentiles who are becoming part of this new Jesus movement. The church, uh, they, they've never in, in their lives, in their histories, 
been on the same side. Because Jews thought that they were the chosen people and anyone who was not was a pagan, a heathen, going straight to the Dickens. They just didn't want to be around other people. Paul's whole call was to bring in the world to this movement. And reconciliation means that they had to be unified, work together in harmony in the spirit of love. So the questions we have to ask ourselves, and this is a question no matter what leaning you are, what political leaning, if you call yourself a Christian, how seriously do we take the mandate? It's not a suggestion. God calls us to reconciliation. Right. That's what we are. We are ambassadors for that purpose. How seriously do we take this mandate of reconciliation? We say we believe this, but how seriously do we take it? The text that we read today is a solution to this evil. Paul says, the gospel more than anything else has the power to persuade humankind, and the Greek word here is pytho, it means God does the persuading and urging that brings humankind into this obedience that turns away from evil. So if racism is an evil, God is the one who's gonna to have to turn us away from evil. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. You know, that's why Martin Luther King was so successful in brokering so much change during the civil rights movement. People forget that, and I like to bring that up all the time. It was because it started in the church. Right. He started from the Bible. He said, God is a God of love. Uh -huh. And this is, a, this is tough stuff, because you talk it, but nobody wants to do it. Right. But if you look around you, racism is dragging the world down right now. Amen. The world. Racism. There's a story that Karl Barth, who is a, what, considered one of Christianity's greatest theologians, he's a reformed theologian from our branch of the church, was once asked what he would say to Adolf Hitler if he ever had the opportunity to meet the man for, responsible for the extermination of between five and six million Jews. Now the interviewer thought that Barth would, would rain down some fire and brimstone judgment against this monster named Hitler, but instead, Barth answered, if he had the opportunity to stand in front of Hitler, he would say nothing more than, quote, Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That that had the power to change somebody like Hitler. Not judgment, but mercy from God. Only the generosity, joy, and grace of the gospel has the power to change this kind of evil. And as I look out on the obscenity of what's going on in this uh, election, or look out at terrorism, or look out at, at any of the anger and rage that seems to be traversing our planet, I see no global commissions, no United Nations, no world leaders, no multicultural political movements, no economic plans. I see nothing. I've been here a long time. I've watched people work at this for a long time. I see nothing that can counter what's going on save the love of God. That's it, that's the answer. We're sitting on the answer right here. We entreat you, we plead with you on behalf of Christ Jesus to be reconciled to God. So we look for how does that work itself out? And, and again, this is something I've been trying to figure out because I have so many issues with race myself. As Chase told you earlier, this Wednesday, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization is meeting here at RPC for a general assembly to solidify some of the issues that we're working on. Now I tell you that because this year the issues are going to be criminal justice and housing. Now whether you know it or not, those are our issues. Those are issues of this neighborhood. Housing is a real problem in this neighborhood. Gentrification is setting in. We're losing our houses. Uh, uh, criminal justice, why is everybody in jail black? What, what's, what's up? That's been going on for generation and generation and generation. I'm not saying that there are not reasons that we are, are in the uh, penal system because there are some legitimate reasons that some people are there. But there's a system that's keeping us down. And we cannot be blind to it any longer. So what I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm entreating you, I'm pleading with you to come to this rally here at this church this 
Tuesday. Tuesday at, what do we say, six? Seven? seven. This is happening, is it seven? It starts at six. Please come. I'm not asking you to come just because it'll make Milton look good. Milton, you here? <laughs> Milton is our GP Ohio rep, uh, representative. I'm not just saying it because it'll make us look good or me look good. Roxbury Presbyterian Church is one of the founding churches that put GBIO together. It works because we get to be what we are in GBIO. We're Christians. We don't have to be Muslims. We don't have to be Buddhists. We're Christians and we're a part of this. And this is our ministry of reconciliation. Yes. So please come. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, we need 50 people. I am begging you to be a part of this. This is the kind of thing i got to tell you. I even said, oh, GBIO, they got so many means, they got so many rules. But I don't see any other way that we're going to fight some of our issues. And housing is a race issue. Right. Okay? Criminal justice is an issue of race. To be reconciled to God means we are restored back into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he satisfied God's judgment. We are on our way to the cross. So this time of Lent, we think about reconciliation. Christ has given us this ministry of reconciliation because God has reconciled the world, the world to him. Now Karl Barth knew what few are willing to admit today, that the whole world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. I'm not saying join the world so you can change and be something else. I'm saying take Jesus with you in the world. It means nothing, not your job, not your circumstances, not your background, not your political ambitions. Nothing should be uh, above Jesus. But it also means this reconciliation that nothing should limit your assessment of another human being. You see, because... God has reconciled the world to him. He wants us to reconcile with each other if we really believe what we say about Jesus. Now this is what it comes down to. This is where the rubber meets the road. Right, right. If you really believe Jesus is your savior, then you have no right, no one has any right to think less of anybody else. Amen. You see, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, we cannot see anybody other than a creature for whom Christ has died and risen. He, you see, Christ died for the whole world. He didn't just die for Roxbury. He didn't just die for the Tea Party. He died for the whole world. That means that no one is outside the reach of God's grace. Amen. But we have to understand that in our hearts. I always point out the civil rights movement as a laboratory for this experiment on reconciliation because Martin Luther King took that seriously. He wrote, I am convinced that love is the most durable power in the world. To return hate for hate does nothing but intensify the existence of evil in the universe. Somebody's got to have sense enough and religion enough to cut off the chain of hate, and this can only be done through love. Now, when I first uh, answered the call, I had one sermon. It was called The Risk of Love. I must have done that a hundred <laughs> times. I did it so much that a friend of mine said, don't do that sermon anymore. <laughs> You won't have to find something else to preach about. And so I got a little, you know, I got a little insecure about it. But the point is, we have got to keep talking about love. We gotta, you know, we gotta figure it out. We use the term so loosely. Right. I'm trying to go back to the Bible and figure out a new way to say love. Because if we ignore this, if we don't give this its due, then how are we going to reconcile? How are we going to do it? To lose hope in anybody is to lose hope in ourselves. To lose hope in love is to lose hope in God. We have got to figure this out. It's important to notice here that God has not reconciled himself to the world. God reconciles the world to himself. God doesn't change. God is the one who has the power to change the world. So I'm not saying by refocusing this work on GBIO, we will change this. I'm saying we are meant to become God's righteousness, his reformed and transformed people, his ambassadors. So we are giving God credit for changing things. We are honoring God by being his ambassadors wherever we can. That's why I'm saying go to GBIO. That's why I'm going with GBIO this week, because I had some issues, but I'm going to go because this is the way I can be an ambassador 
for Christ to the world, yeah. to Muslims, to Jews, to whoever in the world. And I'm asking you to join me now. This does not end with just reconciling with GBIO. That's the easy part. You can reconcile with the person that comes from the suburbs. You gotta be reconciled with those folks in your family. You gotta be reconciled with your neighbors. You gotta be reconciled with the people on the street. If you're gonna love God whom you don't see, you gotta love your neighbor whom you see. So this is not just a message for Donald Trump. This is a message for us. And the only way you can get to reconciliation you gotta forgive somebody. Amen. You gotta forgive somebody. Forgiveness is at the heart of our faith. It penetrates to the core of life. If you ask me what's wrong with the world today, I would say it's a spirit of unforgiveness. What's gonna break the cycle of injustice, injustice, hatred, evil? We gotta forgive. That's Jesus. The whole point of creation, really, the whole point of salvation is relationship. Restoring relationship, God's plan from the very beginning to reconcile the world to himself. Now, you can't get to reconciliation if you don't forgive. You can get to forgiveness and maybe not reconcile, but you cannot get to reconciliation if you don't forgive. I look for an update on those relatives of the Bible study members who were slaughtered in Charleston, South Carolina. I couldn't find anything. I didn't know if any reporters has talk, have talked to them, and I'm sure there have been some reports, but I could not find it. I imagine many of them have wrestled with their own public statements about forgiveness. Because that, really, forgiveness is very difficult. There is nothing easy about setting aside the rage that comes from deep and painful wounds. It takes courage, perseverance, and endurance. But this is what I have discovered. Forgiveness is first rooted in your relationship with God. So if you're sitting there and saying, I don't care what you say, Reverend Liz, I'm not gonna forgive him because he did the absolute worst thing to me. Just know this, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Now this is said several times, many times in the Bible. It's not just a passing text. Jesus repeats this, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. There is a lot of unforgiveness in this sanctuary. It, it, it permeates, it comes out in different ways. It comes out in anger. It comes out in kind of an off, off-handedness. It comes out in, in, in just ways you can see that people are detached. There's a lot of unforgiveness in the world. I have unforgiveness in my heart. It's, 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 it's tough to let go of these things. But I'm going to remind you over and over again because God reminds me. Now we are wired for vengeance. We are wired to strike back. But, but we will not get to reconciliation if we do not first forgive. So as we get prepared to go to this table, and break bread and wine in remembrance of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to really search your souls about this notion of forgiveness. Before we can forgive Donald Trump, before we can forgive the people outside, you have to forgive people closer to you. You may have to forgive yourself, but that's what God wants us to do. That's the only way we're going to be able to be really bold and valuable ambassadors for God. That's the only way. We have to speak the truth of Jesus with authority. We have to speak love because love is in our hearts. But we have to speak most importantly through our actions, yes. our memory text. And I hope that you will look at it more and more. Show that you are a letter from Christ. You're the letter. You are, you are the missive. You are the epistle. The result of our ministry is not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Forgive, forgive, let go. Let go of that stuff right now inside you, in your heart. Let's pray. Don't let your gifts just tangle in the dirt. Yeah, use what you got to edify the church.